And welcome everybody to the huddle, Kiga 9 streaming sports talk show every week uh, on Tuesday at this time, three o'clock uh, Tucson time. I'm joined by Pat Paris. Pat, good afternoon. How are you today? Good, Jason. Ready to talk a little U of A football. Yeah, back after a little vacation. At least uh, at least I was. You're going on your vacay next week. Next the huddle week, will, yep. will still be here. And yeah, sports are certainly in Tucson, very seasonal. You've got uh, you know the overlap with U of A football and basketball in, in the late fall. But, but here we are transitioning kind of the end of summer. We've got not too much going on in Tucson in July. And then it kind of build, starts building with football. And today, uh, U of A Football Media Day. And for those who don't know, it's the local media day where they make everybody available for interviews that we use throughout the month or, or two even. Uh, we're going to use to put together a special. And we're going to show some of you that today and, and talk through it and go over all that. So, Pat, sound good to you? Sounds good to me, Jason. And they've got to be better than 1-11. I, I think they will be, Pat. I think and, you know, they will be, too. One of the clues or the cues to me uh, is that – clue – is that, you know, w- when you're 1-11, they still outgained four teams last year in games that they lost. You know, to me, that's a sign that things can be a lot better the following year. Morale was still good for a team 1-11. and You know how things can kind of blow up. Uh, they've got a starting quarterback going into this year who's proven – uh, the Pac-12 freshman of the year in, in Jaden Glor. So anyway, one of the things, Pat, that Jed Fish, the head coach of U of A football, talked about today uh, was that he mentioned how this is almost year one. Not that last year didn't count, but he hadn't been able to bring people into the program, his players, in last year. So he was kind of dealing with the, the players he was dealt, though he did have his own coaches. He talked a little bit about that today. And, Pat, let's – Take a look at this clip, and then we're going to get you to uh, you and I to react uh, to that right after this. So here's Jed Fish talking today about how this is really year one, and, and last year was was year zero. Well, I have all expectations for Jaden to be our starting quarterback, right, so. and if that is the case, then he's going to be the person that takes the reps with the ones. Um, I don't think that's um, really unique to any situation. Um, there's going to be times in practice that. We might throw Noah or Jordan in um, with a group, but uh, their group will be going in with the twos or the threes, and then they'll rotate and they'll um, get some reps every now and then with the ones. But I think it's really important that Jaden spends his time um, getting acclimated with getting snaps from the starting center, that he gets acclimated with throwing to the same group of receivers that we're going to have to uh, in season. All right, so my bad. I set that up wrong. That was uh, Jed Fish talking about how Jaden Delore is going to be the quarterback this year. But, Pat, I do want to talk about that because that was a big issue for you last year, that they didn't have a starting quarterback, not just going into fall camp, but even the first couple of weeks of the season, and you felt that really held the team back. How much better do you feel going into this year with Jaden Delore as the starting quarterback? Well, much better, Jason, because there's an obvious number one this year. And I, I thought my my one criticism about not having – uh, a, really a concept or a clue about who, who should be a quarterback. Last year, it was just a potluck. And it, it bothered me that they didn't identify who the, the best quarterback may have been uh, all along uh, last season. And, and now you've gotten an obvious number one when Jaden Delora coming in, uh, transfer who was outstanding as freshman year at Wash U. And, and now I, I think it's the right attitude. You have to go in with the number one mentality. This is our guy. He's going to be the starting quarterback. The ups and downs don't matter because he's proven himself already in the Pac-12. So I feel I feel much better about about where they're at quarterback wise this year. Yeah, by the way, I feel like maybe that Noah Fafita would even be number two on the depth chart at this point, just based upon how well he did in the spring game. And something that Fish kind of even mentioned today, he was talking about how Jaden Delora would go with the ones and then maybe it would be, you know, Noah or uh, Jordan McLeod coming in later. I got the sense that the depth chart might be Fafita too. Not that he would actually be the first to come into a game just because he doesn't have as much experience as Jordan McLeod, but I wouldn't be surprised if the depth chart is after Delora, it would then go to uh, Fafita, the freshman from Servite High School in California, then to Jordan McLeod, then to Gunnar Cruz, then to Will Plummer coming off an injury. doesn't mean that, that, that Fafita would be the first person in, but, but just kind of basing off, off that, uh, I think that actually might be the initial depth chart. But more importantly than that, hey, 
you know, unless Jaden Delore gets hurt or something crazy happens, he's going to be the guy for Arizona football. Yeah, he's got the pedigree. He's certainly, uh, as I mentioned, he's been proven in the Pac-12. That goes a long way. And now you can, when you have one guy and you're still not searching, okay, you know, last year there were three, four uh, potentials and they all, they all ended up playing at some point. But now you, you, get to, you get to scheme, you get to plan, you get to game plan for the one guy, and that's Jaden Delora. And you know what he can do based on what he's done in the past, and you've, you've seen him in spring, so you know, you've got a good idea as well. I, just, I think all the way around, everybody's feeling with more comfortable, uh, from uh, Jed Fish and the coaching staff to all the players that are blocking for him, that are r- running routes for him, that are taking handoffs from him. So that means a lot. And certainly, a uh, draw. Uh, Jaden Delora is going to have more tools to work with this year. Uh, a couple of them freshmen, Ted Aroto McMillan, the wide receiver. Also a tight end, Kean Burnett, uh, who they flipped from USC. His dad played here. This is a four or five star recruit. Uh, should be a fantastic tight end for the Wildcats. And uh, one of the reasons that Kean Burnett said he was came here was because of the pro style offense that the, the Wildcats uh, ran. And we're going to let you listen to that right now. This is a freshman tight end, Kean Burnett. Everything. And then <clears throat> really the world to me to come to a post style offense. That's why I'm here to be in an offense, a system where they run the same schemes as you see the Rams and the Patriots running um, really means a lot. And it's really cool to be here. So do you take more pride in a great catch or a great block? Mm, that's a great question. I honestly think for me, a great catch. But I think they both are very, very important. You got to have both for sure. So he's not technically a wide receiver, but he is a, a receiver, and not just him, but uh, Jacob Cowling. He is the wide receiver who's a transfer from UTEP, put up big numbers in that system, came here partly for, for family reasons. So it's definitely Arizona a, a lot stronger in the receiver uh, room than they were a season ago. Oh, there's no doubt. I, I think you have to start by looking at just the roster makeup and, comp- and, and how, how it's all come together for, for Jed Fish. 113 players on the roster, which is a lot, 113 players, 54 of them are brand new suiting up for the Wildcats this fall for the very first time. Jason, that's 48% of the roster. I'm not great at math, but I figured that one out. 48% of the roster has never played for the U of A before. You talked about how this is Jed Fish's year number one because, you know, you, 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 you didn't have a lot of time to prepare and you just basically, it was, you know, kind of a grab bag of what you have on the roster last year. So if this is year number one, starting with 48% of the roster being brand new, there should be some excitement. Now, it's got to be tempered uh, for sure because this is a 1-11 and team. And those who say, well, they can win six games and go to a bowl game. Let's woe it up here a little bit. Not many teams go from one win to six wins, even when you uh, remake over the roster with 48% uh, new guys. No, I think five and seven might be a a legitimate uh, uh, record to strive for. Just coming off a off a one win season, uh, I think I'd be happy with that. Uh, they certainly also, you know, certainly have the talent like we've talked about uh, to improve. And I talked about earlier how you know they had those four games where they outgained their opponents and, and and still lost. So why did they do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that, Pat. One, this team only had six takeaways the whole season. Okay, I believe that was tied for the defense. That's tied for last in FBS. And they were, ter- uh, by the way, they only got three in 2020 on the five-game season. They were bad that year. And then in the red zone, they struggled on both ends of the floor, uh, both ends of the both uh, ends of the um, of the field in the red zone, offense and defense for the for the football team. And that's how you outgain opponents and still lose games. So that is a giant area uh, of improvement for this team that they can do this year and come up with a better record. And, and we, we, for obvious reasons, everybody does it. We concentrate a lot on the offense and why not? That, that's the flashy thing. And, and you've got to score points to win games. And last year they didn't even score very many points and, and they lost games, but defensively, I think they're going to be better. And the guy that stick out, sticks out to me is that Hunter Eccles, the USC edge rusher that they, mm-hmm. they got to transfer. Um, I'm looking for big things from him. Uh, you, you're, you're looking at a defense with a new defensive coordinator um, and maybe a different a different approach to things, a different scheme. And I know it's definitely a different scheme, and you'll talk more about that here in a minute, Jason. But uh, I think this defense will help turn that – you talked about out, out gaining your opponent. The only way you get you, you get to turn those into wins is if the defense steps up, and I think that, 
that it would be a, a marked difference this year for the 2022 Cats. The emphasis will be on stopping the run. That's just a Johnny Nansen thing. Not that Coach Brown didn't do that last year, but the things also that we talked about uh, with the takeaways and the red zone. And so I did a little one-on-one -on -one today at Media Day uh, with new defensive coordinator Johnny Nansen, and we talked about uh, those three things. And uh, here's a one-on-one -on -one I did earlier today with Arizona defensive coordinator uh, Johnny Nansen, and we'll listen and then come back and discuss. Joined now by Coach Johnny Nansen, the new defensive coordinator for the Wildcats. Coach Nansen, thanks for a couple of minutes here. Uh, what is the number one thing that you're looking to bring to Coach Jed Fish's defense this year? You know, I think the kids have to have fun. You know, that's what I want them to do. You know, obviously all the great things you hear, we got to be physical, we got to be nasty and all that. But they got to enjoy the game. It's still a football game, you know, and I think if they're having fun, all the other things are going to fall into place. So that's what I'm looking forward to. You know, obviously, you know, the coaches, you know, all the coach talk about effort and all that. That stuff is going to come. But I want these kids to really enjoy, embrace, you know, what they're doing here. So that's what I'm going to bring. Yeah, it is a game at, at the end of the day, right? Uh, certainly you want to have a lot more takeaways. Is that something that you coach, or does that just come be, with being an aggressive defense? It, it, everything you have to coach. You got you to coach energy. You got to coach, you know, uh, you know how they get dressed and everything you know what I mean they're still kids you know um, so but that's the part that I see in college football over the years is so much a business aspect to, to the game that they forget how to have fun so you know and that's my message to them yesterday in our team in our team meeting hey you know what you know it's a next play mentality enjoy the game have fun with your teammates because you know what it goes by fast so that's the lessons that we have to teach our guys and, and, and make them believe that they can do it too. You know what I'm saying? And I think, that, you know, our staff is pretty, you know, I, I'm lucky. I said this before. I got every one of my assistants used to be a coordinator. So to have those guys in the building and them to take over, you know, when I'm saying something or sending a message along, you know, like having fun. We got to have fun as coaches too. So I think that's a message moving forward. Red zone, it's something the program needs to get better at both on offense and defense. Is that just a different mindset? How do you coach red zone? Like I said, you got to practice. If you're going to be good at red zone, you got to practice it. And I think that's what coach is doing. You know, we're, as a matter of fact, the first three days, that's where our focus is going to be. And then obviously, our, we got to teach our guys about red zone, <clears throat> what to expect out of the red zone. Because the playbook for the offense shrank down. And we got to keep it simple for our guys on defense so we could be able to execute when we get down there. And last question, you know, you're hearing about, you know, Jalen Harris. Uh, give me one or two guys who you've seen on film or you saw in spring practice who've kind of perked your, your uh, ear and your eye up a little bit. Hey, he's got a lot of potential or, hey, I can't wait to work with him. I think everybody on the defensive line, you know, uh, you know, from Harris to Paris, uh, Tank Wilson, uh, you know, I think Tia, um, you know, Hunter, obviously. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited about our front. You know, I'm excited about our secondary. I keep saying this. I think, you know, I've been around football for a long time now, especially in this league. I think we have one of the better, better group in the, in the league. And uh, so, you know, our expectation for those guys, man, they really got to show up this year and help us. And then our, their leadership just got to help, you know, the older guys because they're the veteran back there to help the younger guys and bring them along. So those are the guys that, st that stood out to me. Johnny Nansen, thanks for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. All right, again, Jason Barr, Pat Paris. This is The Huddle on KGUN 9 streaming uh, channels, our weekly sports digital talk program. Pat Paris, a lot to unpack there. Uh, first, your thoughts on that before we break down uh, uh, every, all the uh, angles of what you talked about. Well, I think Nansen, first of all, is impressive. You know, this is a guy who was just at UCLA as a, as a, a line, defensive line coach. He's been in the Pac-12 for, I don't know, I think it's over a decade that he's been coaching in the Pac-12. So he knows the ins and outs. And I think that uh, you heard a lot of what he was saying there that would impress me is he kept referring back to Jed Fish's plan or Jed Fish's ideas. And when a defensive coordinator and a head coach get along well, especially a, def uh, a head coach that's an offensive-minded head coach like Jed Fish is, that's actually a good thing, and I think um, and I liked uh, several of the things he said, Jason, but that one in particular really stood out to me. And that and the, the guys having fun, hard to have fun when you're 111. I know that that's the whole key. It's a yeah, lot of fun when yeah, you win, right? Yeah, it's a lot of fun when you win. 
Uh, and it's not so much fun when you lose. They did have a pretty good um, mentality, uh, even though they were one and eleven last season. But winning games will help help uh, help them certainly uh, have a lot more fun. But I I did like what he said, and I think he's right. I think that front, the defensive front, is going to be key for them. I think it's it's their strong point on defense, and if they can uh, stop the run, as you mentioned earlier, and if they can get some pressure on quarterbacks, this can turn the whole defense around, and it it makes you believe that they could have you know, uh, a four or five win season instead of the one win season. Yeah. For people listening and watching at home, feel free to leave a comment uh, as well. And, and and we'll talk about it. Uh, uh, also, did you catch that? They're going to emphasis, emphasize red zone first three, what did first, you say? Three, first, days. first he, three days. First You remember Jason, you and I, well, media members, we had lunch with Jed fish, right. All right. During spring. And, and he said the same thing. He said, we're going to do that. And, and he's obviously he's following through on that. Yeah. Uh, as for Hunter Eccles, um, he's going to start, it sounds like, on the opposite side of Jalen Harris for the pass rush. They that's get a heck of a duo, right? That's going to yeah. make it better for the for the, the, the secondary to get some yeah. picks and some things like that and some fumbles. So, yeah, they, they got to get to the quarterback. So that was definitely a, a takeaway. And uh, uh, what was the other one? The, and the takeaways, too. You got He's got to coach the takeaways. You got to go after – you got to go after the football. And, so. and, and you can, co- and I agree, you can coach him, Jason, but I think in, in, in essence, it's just getting guys in the right place. You know, if guys are in the right place, turnovers happen. Yeah. When guys are chasing, turnovers don't ever happen. And we've seen how many years in a row now, at least two, and I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes back to even Rich Rod days. You, you saw guys chasing on defense instead of being in the right position. Yeah, no, the defense has been been up and down for, for a while. Uh, certainly, uh uh, 12 was, was, was a rough year. And then they get Scooby, right. And they're better. And then they took a step backward and the whole thing. And it yeah. kind of brings us to where we are uh, today, but definitely a deeper, uh, a deeper, stronger team. And, uh, uh, do you buy that? You know, we talked about that earlier with Jed fish when he talks about this year being year number one. Yeah. I think he's done Jed fish, a tremendous job selling the program. I'm going to get to a comment he made about uh, the NFL. Let's see. Agree with him that there's too much emphasis on the business end. He saw this uh, Wally Wildcat. Wally Wildcat. He's talking about Johnny Nance and that it's more fun for fans when we can tell the team is having fun. Yeah, Yeah. you bet. You bet. I mean, look at the joy they had with the one win last year. (laughs) Against Cal. Not after (laughs) after Cal. And then they admitted afterwards, well, yeah, we weren't just playing our opponent every week. We were playing the streak as well. Uh, Fish admitted that after after not saying so. I think that Jed Fish really has done a fantastic job selling the program. When he talks about U of A football being the 33rd NFL team, that's a bold comment. Now, to clarify, he's not saying they're – uh, they could play with NFL teams. He's talking about the coaching staff and the years of experience. But I mean, you got to sell something to recruits, and when you sell them when you when you sell on them. This is a pro style offense. This is the same offense that the Rams and the Jets and whatever NFL team runs. That's what you're going to be playing in. You've got assistant coaches who have 150 years. <laughs> NFL coaching experience. It works, but I tell you what we've heard from players. Every player to a T didn't care about one in 11. That's in the past. It really doesn't matter to, to them. Right. Because as I mentioned, 48% of them never played on a one 11 team. They weren't here last year. So it doesn't matter. And I, I think that Jed fish more times than not, he hasn't gotten every guy he's recruited certainly, but more times than not, he's won the recruiting battle on these guys because He's got that infectious, positive attitude, and he, he knows how to sell a program. He's a great salesperson when it comes to the University of Arizona football program. I'm really worried, Jason, about when it comes time to execute as a head coach and as a football team, whether or not Jed Fish is the right guy. And he's got to prove that he is. I, I, he didn't show me anything last year that said, oh, this guy's going to be a great coach. He showed me that he's a great recruiter. He's a great motivator. Now he's got to start showing us that he can uh, coach these guys to win some football. I, I think you make way too much of, of play calling. Sebastian Rendon, I don't think we're going to put your comment on the screen, but but I do know what you mean. It did take courage for him to say that. you got to be a little bit yeah. bold sometimes. Uh, I think that you, Pat, make way too much of play calling when a play call works. No, is- you're, you're wrong, Jason. I don't say play. I don't I don't mean just play calling. Play calling is the is the end is the last thing you do as a coach, okay? It's everything getting up to that point. And it's also, you know, p- putting them in position to succeed and you have to have got, you know, the plays that are going to enable them to succeed. 
That's what I'm talking about. Yes, you got to call the right play at the right time. That's part. It's a part of the equation. I'm not saying that's the most important part of it. It's all important. And he's got to show me that he's been able to do that. And 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 he's it's it, your year zero. It's behind us. They were one and eleven. It's behind us. Now he gets to show us that he can coach. Whether it's year year zero, year one, or year two, whatever, you're going to be better in your second 12 months of your job, right? When you start a new job, a job you've never done before to be a head coach, whatever it is you do with your walk of life, you're going to be much better in year two after you've had a full calendar uh, a go around uh, uh, of things. In year two, with that experience, you're going to be better. So I expect him to be a better head coach. And you know what? If he if I see him mess up in a certain way, uh, whether it's a two-point conversion or a play call or not going after this or that, I'll I'll say it. I'll say it. But uh, and I realize he's won the off season, uh, and and he's won two off seasons, and he, and they went one and eleven in 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 that year. But um, um, to me, I think you're going to see a lot of improvement this year. And if there isn't. I'll be the first to come out and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm big time disappointed. I don't think that's going to happen, though. Wait, I, I want to know, and, and I, I'm guessing that it didn't matter to these players, these new players, the players that have been around. And I, I don't know if you even got a chance to ask or anybody got a chance to ask. Uh, was there was there much talk or much discussion about, you know, USC, UCLA defection and, and, and maybe a chip on their shoulder when it comes to playing those two teams? Uh, I tell you what, Nansen was asked about it. The defensive coordinator. Because he was at UCLA. Yep. The he last said, I don't care about, you know, my focus. He gave a standard. I don't really care about them. My focus is on that. I think one other player was asked about it. And, uh, you know, I don't remember. There must not have been an earth shattering answer or I would have remembered it. But I will say that at Pac-12 Media Day, Jed Fish did say, hey, you know, I don't think this is going to hurt us in recruiting and even more bold was the commissioner, George Klyovkov, who said, this is going to help the PAC 12 in recruiting in every other sport. I think Pat, and we should spend a couple of minutes on, on this because we haven't been able to talk about uh, right. uh, uh, this yet. I think that this is going to have ramifications, bad ones for UCLA, even if we don't know all of what there will be. Uh, I don't think that football team is going to do as well having to go to Wisconsin or Michigan, or get upset at a Rutgers team that can't wait to have UCLA in. I think you're going to see the Coliseum with 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 Wisconsin, oh, with Iowa fans for a home game. I I just think there's going to be ramifications more so for UCLA uh, down the road than than USC. So so we'll see. Uh, but but uh, you know it's it's talked about uh, a little bit. Um, but uh, you know for most of the guys here. You know, this is going to happen, you know, three, two or three years from now. So it's not going right. to affect everybody right away. Yeah. And that's why I, ex I expect the players not to care all that much. But, you know, there will be there will be talk leading up to each one of those games. I'm sure we'll ask them or they'll be asked, uh, you know, when they yeah. face US USC and UCLA. Hunter and Apple said he had a chip on his shoulder from not the, well, USC not playing him enough. Yes. USC, because that's where he just came from. And yeah. then clearly you don't leave a situation when, you know, that, that's good. You, you, the transfer portal is for guys that, that don't think they're getting enough playing time. They can get more playing time elsewhere and he'll get plenty of playing time here. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, there's a chance that he'll, he'll be starting on, on one end with Harris on the other. Uh, I, I will say this, I, I'm in complete agreement with you of, of the, of the winners and losers of the defection by USC and UCLA from the PAC 12 to the big 10. I think you UCLA is the big loser, and I, I think they will be the big loser, uh, and it may do irreparable harm. I look at them as being like uh, Nebraska was when they left left the the big the Big Twelve or the the Big Eight, which became the Big Twelve, and they went to the Big Ten. They have just been a non-factor since the day they started playing football in the Big Ten, and they'll continue to be because. They have Iowa and Wisconsin that they're trying to recruit. And then you get, you know, you get the Penn State's coming in and stealing uh, kids, too. It's it, it's really US, USC gets a lot of the best players anyway in that area. And UCLA now, as you said, they're just going to be uh, and also ran in that conference, in the Big Ten Conference. I, I think the glory days of UCLA are, are, are quickly uh, disappearing in the rearview mirror. Their basketball schedule is going to be like an NBA schedule. Now, they've got a terrific coach in, in Mick Cronin. And, and they hired the right guy, uh, but but I I I don't I agree with you on this. I don't think it's going to work out so well uh, down the road. Um, I wouldn't 
it make me think twice about coming there as a, as a recruit. They're going to need a private plane uh, just for just for some of this travel and tutoring. I mean, it's going to be like remote classes. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you take a look at going all the way across the uh, the, the country, they, for this. they really need the, the the UCLA and USC really need to have Oregon and Washington join the Big Ten. And I don't want to get into that. You know, yeah. and, and we can we let's save another day. But that's the only way you make it work is you have some traveling companions where you can at least stay in the same time zone yeah. for, for more than one game a year. And last thing for me here, I was impressed with George Klievkoff on Pac-12 Media Day. I liked how he what he had to say. He was direct. He was not wishy-washy around the answers. Uh, he was he was on the big he came out he came out fighting a little bit. He came yeah. out with some jazz sure with, with the Big 12 and everything and all open for business comment. I, I like and he was defending his conference. I liked what I heard from him. Uh, uh, and, and when you, when you look at the big 12 media revenue and, and the pac 12, oh, it might be better for Arizona to stay in the pac 12. So I think, you know, there's going to be some well thought out decisions coming here in the next few months. Yeah. And I, and I agree. I, I did, I did appreciate his comments and his tone. And I think it was the right tone. I think what, what I, as a, as a, I, sometimes I get to be, as you know, Jason, a little bit more of a fan, um, about this because of my, you know, connections to the U of A and to Tucson and, and uh, want to see the U of A succeed no matter what sport we're talking about. But what I, I think what I didn't understand at the time is I thought there was a lot more urgency than there than there actually is. And I thought they need to make a decision soon. And I, we, you and I had talked about the next 30 days. Well, here we are. It's over 30 days. And I think they're, they've made the right decision. And that is take your time, get these TV contracts done. And when you get the TV contracts done, It'll kind of all, uh, you know, come out in the wash, as it were. It'll, it, you'll see where you're at. You'll see where the Big 12's at. You'll see where these conferences are. And the Pac-12 has the benefit that no other conference has, even in these super conferences. They have West Coast time zone, and that is huge when it comes to uh, Pac-12 after dark. Whether it's a Pac-12 conference or they join another conference, that part of the TV contract is huge because. Nobody else can offer those late night games on the West Coast um, that are so appealing to ESPN. So uh, in the end, it'll all come out whether this big uh, the Pac-12 stays the same, whether they uh, you know, get get it involved with the Big 12 or whoever it is. Um, they have some time. All right. Sounds good. On that note, I th Pat, I think we're going to wrap it up here because we're coming up on a half hour. Uh, this was a good huddle. We covered a lot. I heard some good stuff from U of A Football Media Day. And oh, by the way. Uh, we have, for those of you watching on, uh, we get we have got a good viewers. Uh, very cool. Can't wait to see what happens. Thanks, Nicole. We get we get a lot of viewers live. We get even more viewers when it gets gets on the record on OTT. And I'm just going to say this: next Tuesday at this time at three o'clock, we have a very special guest, uh, a sports celebrity who a lot of people are a big fan of. And that's all I'm just going to tease. Because uh, I just, just in case it doesn't work out, but but I think it is. The person's already agreed. All right. So next Tuesday at three o'clock, we're gonna have a very, very special guest. You'll be glad you tuned in for it. I promise you. Uh, okay. I promise you that that was not an empty uh, tease. So Pat, on that note, enjoy your vacation next week. Thank you. We'll be back in a couple weeks. All we're right. Paris, I'm Jason Barr. This has been the Huddle here on Kika Nine Streaming uh, Platforms, our weekly sports talk show. I'll see everybody uh, next week at this time, Tuesday at three o'clock. Tucson time. Thanks everybody. See you then.